So uh, today we're joined by Paul Feek uh, from Zombie Dance, and we're going to talk about the new Zombie Dance magazine, Hardbound Book, issue number three. Um, so the book itself is basically a dedication to the 90s uh, Brazilian black metal scene. It covers almost the entire scene in great detail. And as you can see, it's a, it's a very thick hardbound book, and it has biographies and interviews and lots and lots of information that only a diehard like Paul Feek um, has the patience to put together. You know, I'm a diehard fan of this scene as well, but I never uh, got the energy to put something like this together. <laughs> so, um, Paul Feek, you want to just introduce yourself, give us some background on how you got into the scene, you know, how you got so uh, possessed by the Brazilian sound. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, basically, um, I started to get interested into the scene, I think, into the Brazilian scene, I guess, like everybody else. Uh, started with Sarcophago. I remember a long time ago, I read uh, an old interview as I was learning about black metal. I read an old interview uh, from uh, with Euronymous from uh, Mayhem, and he said basically that was his... Uh, his way of running his label was that if a band looked like Sarcophago, he would uh, immediately sign them. It was sort of a, of a ground rule for him. And I <laughs> immediately caught my eye and I thought, OK, I need to, to dig up on this. And I, I, I immediately started to, to get into the sound back. Fortunately, I guess it was like 12, 13 years ago when you could still quite easily find all these Kogumelo uh, old records for a, a fair price, I guess. Uh, and uh, the the import taxes were a bit uh, easier on us than today, and uh, I really got caught on it. And as I started the magazine, basically my it's how I started the, the whole zombie dance thing was just because I wanted to dig deeper. I wanted to have answers. It was a very selfish thing to say, okay, there's there's informations lacking out there, and I, I will go and interview those bands and try to to hear the sto their stories. I remember one of the, the first band I, I, I ran after was Sadistic Executions, which was, mm -hmm. I, I guess, still today, they're a bit less obscure, but I remember 10 or 12 years ago, so many crazy stories. It was just basically, Sadistic Executions was just uh, five great records and a, a, a thousand crazy stories. It was basically like that. And they were yeah. not online. They were just uh, quite obscure. Um, and I decided that I wanted to know more. Um, and quite recently, I guess five years ago, I really got into the whole 90s Brazilian black metal sound. I mean, of course, I, I the, the, the classics were among my favorite stuff. So I was very, very familiar with Impurity, with Mystifier, even the other ones, uh, Amon Corner, Murder Rape. Those were known, uh, known bands to me. But as I, as, as I tried to approach this sound, I came to realize that there were so many bands, like there was an incredible amount really unprecedented compared to the other scenes, even though, of course, Greece and Norway and Czech Republic had a, a lot of bands. Uh, but in Brazil, it was like a, a cultural thing. It was really huge. Um, and with the help of a few of a few persons, very, very few individual, I really started to 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 dig up on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I thought at first I would just do a small magazine like I did with the, the second issue had a small scene report. I thought it would be just like, hey, Let's explain to people that there are stuff to dig up in there. But yeah, I guess it blew out of proportion and I, I ended up with so much material. And as the music really is, I thought the music was so amazing and really, uh, really got you by the guts that I just wanted to know more and more and more and ended up with being such a, an, an, an immense project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you said you did. <laughs> it was a selfish endeavor, but, you know, obviously this is not a selfish endeavor to... <laughs> spend this much effort in researching you know 90s brazilian black metal where almost <laughs> nothing is really known be beyond the surface level information like impurity murder rate uh with the fire that he mentioned name in corner those bands are pretty well known and you know the the bands that actually release records in that uh time frame are pretty well known headhunter gc all that stuff is pretty well known but yeah. the other demo bands that never really made it there is like, I mean, there are so many bands in here that I didn't even know about. So I don't see how that's a selfish endeavor, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was the first interested in the whole thing, I guess. I was, I, I'm probably the one that, that uh, 
that enjoyed the most the the, the whole book process yeah that we yeah. have so many great songs and new bands that's to be discovered yeah it's definitely great before we we uh we move on though i want to touch on the sad x stories because there are many <laughs> of those and maybe we can spend a few minutes talking about the ones <laughs> that you still remember I'll start with my the one that I like the most, um, and you can find this actually on YouTube. So you should look for it if you don't if you haven't seen it. There's a there's a great commercial where Dave Slave is a cameo in some sort of energy drink or soda or some <laughs> some some junk food commercial where he is a cameo, and um, yeah, the the commercial just says it all. If you ever watch it, <laughs> yeah, and, I'm familiar with. Yeah, you know that one. Yeah, yeah. There's also the wife swap or something. Uh, TV show where Rock was involved. <laughs> uh, was yes, it? with the makeup or was it or? No, that was a, that was uh that was another. I think that was a talk show where he showed up with corpse paint. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there was a wife wife swap. Uh, TV show like one of these reality TV shows where okay, involved, or at least one of the FedEx members is involved. <laughs> <laughs> I need to see this then, <laughs> yeah. And um, not, not to go on and on about FedEx, but there's so much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, somebody sent me an old issue of Penthouse where it's like 1986 or 87, and <laughs> there's an article on uh. On Australian metal and Sad X is featured in there, and they were only like a demo band back then, and okay. they, they still managed to get uh, a couple of photos in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. They they yeah. were really going all the way to get promotion back then. I think they were probably one of the most featured bands that never recorded anything before eighty seven, eighty eight. You would see them everywhere. I yeah, think Mark was very busy sending flyers and drawings and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what the deal was. But yeah. But, well, <laughs> was uh, let's get back to Brazil. So um, there was a book published recently, uh, the United Forces book. Did you know that it was getting published? Or uh, yeah, yeah I know it was it was it was getting published because I bought the, um, the Portuguese edition. Oh, yeah. actually. So the one yeah, that yeah. was uh, was not translated, so I didn't. I didn't understand much about it. Obviously, I got it. I got some parts translated roughly with my phone and with the the, the people I knew uh, who were speaking Portuguese. But it's just just even if you don't understand the language, it's just a piece of art to look at those unpublished Holocaust or pictures and uh, the sex trash features. And once again, so many bands you never heard about because this was even the eighties where it covers. So uh, it's very wide range of genre from uh, grindcore to hardcore to death mm -hmm. metal, thrash metal, because the whole culture, we, I, I just approached black metal, but um, Marcello was really into the whole extreme music thing, I guess, that was back right. then. I mean, the, the lines between subgenres didn't really exist back then, you know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, it was a culture or maybe just punk and and uh, and skater or something very very distinct but basically indeed if it was rough and extreme then it would it would just fit in the in those magazines yeah uh, so i, so think, I decided uh, to also oh, sorry to interrupt but before i forget my thought, um, <laughs> there, there are a couple of sarcophago uh live recordings out there where they cover finnish hardcore band for v cadet have you listened to those yeah yeah absolutely. so they were obviously in touch with Finnish people back then and yeah, uh, yeah. not to derail the conversation even further but Paul Acosta from the air told me a story one time um, about trading Finnish hardcore records for Cogamello records oh, yeah, yeah in, the late, Makes... in the late 80s early 90s because uh, there was cross-pollination of sound and interest from Brazil and Finland and you can kind of hear that too you know yeah. obviously the the group of people around Holocausto, you know, um, like Silva from Barathrum and uh, Impale Nazarene guys. So those guys were all listening to Cogamelo metal back then. It's yeah. an interesting loop to have the 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 Finnish hardcore bands to influence the Brazilian band, and then you have the the, the band the guy from Berit called Holocausto and producing. I mean, putting on the compilation tape, Brazilian band. It's a, it's a very cool back and forth. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think the this, you know, the underground scene without the internet was more pure, and you, it was easier to trace the pollination 
how the music traveled from one continent to the other and you know how that created a separate scene um in that host country um and that yeah so that's just a side note but i thought it was interesting yeah absolutely and it usually was i mean maybe it was just by accident on some point that it was finnish hardcore uh, because maybe some guy from finland had contacts over there could be really a a really small detail that made that happen. Um, yeah. Maybe one, one small record, one small dub tape could have a lot of influence actually on, on many bands. It's yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there is, uh, I'm going to keep on sidetracking this conversation, but uh, <laughs> uh, there's a band from Finland called Porka Makab. Do you know yeah. them? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. They're, they're more on the hardcore end of things, but uh, the guys themselves are extremely into Brazilian old metal, and uh, they even name their titles like song titles in Portuguese. <laughs> so, um, I, I actually... one of the guys he came into the shop one time, and we were oh, talking cool. about old Brazilian metal. And, <laughs> so yeah, that that connection is still there. I think they they play in Brazil. Um, I don't even know if they're still around, but they have played in Brazil. Previous. Okay. Yeah. Don't they have actually a split LP with uh, Armageddon, I think, or something like that? Probably, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like really that. follow hardcore much, so um, yeah, I'm sure they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so that's how I got, I guess, in touch with Marcello because I, I bought the book directly from him. Uh, there was mm. no distribution here in Europe, I think, yeah. uh, not even in Portugal, actually. Um, and I was very, very impressed. It was quite an inspiring work, and uh, it it really proved how how big the 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 there was a gap to fill. I mean, it was so so much information was lacking. You can read this United Force book, and so much stuff you have no idea about. It's it's a different world. It's really really interesting, really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I I did the same. I got the book from the editor and. Uh... I knew that an English version was in the works because he asked me if I wanted to do it at some point. And I turned it okay. down because the cost of production for a book that size was so much. Yeah, um, yeah. And I figured this was a much bigger project. The 80s um, Brazil is pretty important. So I, I told him to go to Brazilian points. I figured that was a better fit. And I'm glad that he did because, uh, you know, a publisher that, deals mainly with books by makes more sense or something yes, that is enormous. Sense. Yeah. But anyways, uh, uh, I only brought it up because I think it's perfect timing that uh, Zombie Dance came out around the same time because um, as I said in the previous podcast that I did, um, it's, it's pretty much a companion piece. You know, one kind of flows nicely into the other and you even feature Marcello yeah. in your in your introduction so i thought that was just uh perfect timing i don't know if you planned it that way <laughs> absolutely not absolutely not yeah. i've been working on the book for so long that it was just gonna come out when it comes out but uh yes i think it's great timing indeed and i think the 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 book by marcello i, I still haven't gotten the english version hasn't reached europe re yet but uh, mm -hmm. It's an important piece, I think. It's an important testimony, and it, it shows how much how, how much we're lacking on the on the subject. He was the yeah. man to do it, really, because he was yeah. there. He knew the the people, and yes, it's very eager to read his uh, memories and the the yeah, it's, it's the, pretty English good chapters. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a really good one. Um, so, why did you pick the '90s Brazilian scene? Is it just because it was the least covered? I know '80s. 80s is a lot more known and it's semi-covered in some of the so-called black metal books usually just with like sepultura and sarcophagal mentioned in passing um but yeah why did you why did you choose the 90s brazilian scene well for for a few reasons and uh one of one of them you actually mentioned is that the 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 genres were so uh so intertwined with each other black metal death metal uh, uh death core you would you would call it back then you would call it art core and in brazil the, the scene was so huge in the 80s that it was way too tentacular knowing how perfectionist i am you, you see how big the book is actually just over the 90s mm -hmm. if i had to go in the other genres and started to dig up and reach out and it it would have been way too ambitious i think mm -hmm. to to cover that another thing is that indeed uh, as far as black metal is concerned has been covered before 
Um, and one thing that I really like is that I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I mean, black metal is definitely the style that I, that I enjoy the most and it's really important to me. And uh, in the 90s, black metal was really a movement per se. It was admitted, everybody mm -hmm. called it black metal. It was not some, it was not deathcore or satanic speed death metal. It was really black metal. And I wanted to uh, to, to focus on um, a movement that was also an, an identity, a cultural identity, because it, it means something you go black metal, you don't go deaf or trash or heavy. You This was the black metal movement. And in the mm -hmm. 80s, it wasn't so easy to... Uh, dissociate from the other genres yeah yeah um probably because it was still an incubation period it was just being, being created um so yeah i mean they were calling it death core and death metal and but it didn't sound anything like what people perceive as both of those subgenres now um so yeah the 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 interesting thing about the brazilian 90s scene is that it was kind of short-lived you know, it was essentially like if you just talk about the years, it was essentially just like four years or maybe five years. Yeah. There wasn't much good stuff that came out after '95, in my opinion. Um, why do you, Why do you think that is? And we talked about this before, but I think we should, you know, expand on it a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there, there are a few, a few, uh, a few ideas, a few theories, but uh, I I think one of them is that uh, there were not enough label to support all the bands internationally and uh, the the language barrier was very strong in uh, in uh, brazil which means it was a very local scene so sometimes some bands would never go out of their own region or their own town which actually when you see how big brazil is it makes sense if if the culture is here and you can make great gigs just in your local scene then i guess you're fine since they wouldn't speak so so well english um uh, there wasn't so much exported back then, and it really didn't. All the attention at some point when there was a when there was a time to go, all the attention went on the Nordic sound, uh, which was pretty much the opposite of what Brazilian uh, black metal was doing. I mean, no Norway. I mean, they made beautiful record. Those Norwegian mm -hmm. guys, they made something beautiful. The bosom style is just refined, and even if it's grim, it sounds good. Uh, Brazilian black metal was really making a racket it was chaotic it was about mm -hmm. it's it's i think it's as good but it's it was chaotic uh, so it it really was not uh fashionable definitely not when the opportunity came so i guess a lot of it grew tired of it um only a few bands made a career very few when you compare a very small percentage maybe five percent or two percent or something like yeah. that i don't it's even very... think it's five percent because yes, mean, you have an entire book to I mean, yeah 260 pages of book and like maybe three bands made it out uh, i guess out of so yeah. like you know <laughs> impurities only played in you know germany once at my festival yeah uh, <laughs> mystifier yeah. is probably the only band that's actually made it kind of yeah. big um yeah absolutely well obviously sepultura you know and if sarcophago ever decides to play they could play walk and fest or something but you know probably from the 90s yeah we're talking about less than one percent i think yeah absolutely absolutely which is crazy considering how many bands there were i guess one of the main problem also was that uh, uh the lack of label of local labels out there which yeah. I guess was way way harder to run a proper business over there uh the, you can only count i guess three or four labels for uh, 150 bands, which is definitely not enough. And Kogumelo was out there, but they came from the 80s. Uh, they had mm -hmm. their hands full, definitely. When you see they were still uh, publishing some of the bands they signed in the 80s. Uh, then you have so many new bands. They, they just couldn't uh, sign all the bands. Just was not enough, definitely. And then there were Hell Lion, but even Hell Lion is quite famous for signing international bands. So... Uh, Mm -hmm. the, the the record business in Brazil were more trying to um, license record from Germany or from SPV from big labels to yeah. have a, to have a, a secure buck than to risk it with a ultra chaotic band's name uh, this Necro Disseminator and that was maybe not the best bets uh, in terms yeah. of business somehow I guess there was a lack of resource as well yeah it was definitely a there was a, a shift in interest from domestic metal of the 80s in Brazil to more of an international taste 
you know, American death metal was making a huge wave in the scene back then. And obviously the European black metal movement uh, had a big impact on Brazil from Norwegian black metal to Greek black metal. I think more Greek black metal stuff was popular in the early 90s, at least in Brazil. Yeah. You can hear that in bands like Mur Murder Rape. Uh, the second impurity was pretty much, you know, Greek plus semi-L or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can you can hear the shifts. You can really hear them actually all the way back from the 80s when bands were starting very, very black metal, like uh, in right. that that you did on record. Mm -hmm. uh, shifting at some point to something that was maybe more popular to some yeah. uh, skate, skater trash and uh, yeah 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 that that was a disappointment when I heard that second demo <laughs> to be <laughs> yes. honest you know that first side is so good and you flip it over and it's just regular trash yes um, it's it's not bad considering but it's just doesn't have the same spirit it's just uh, yeah day and night yeah um while well, pussy whipper left so I think that yeah. was probably the uh, impetus for them to change or something. Yeah. But yeah, he, I guess you're right. Even in the 80s, um, because Mystifier goes back into the 80s, mm -hmm. and even Impurity, 89, and they were already listening to the Blasphemy demo. Yeah, um, absolutely. And they're basically combining Sarcophago and Blasphemy and whatever else they were listening to and making it more extreme back then. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great, it's a perfect cocktail of influence, but it seems to always go to the, the the most extreme. There's something about extremity that's, uh, they were not there to make uh, nice music, definitely. No, not. no, no. I think, uh, you know, I mentioned this to other people, I don't know if we talked about it, but I think it's, it's related to the climate and then probably geopolitics and you know, we talked about geopolitics before. We just don't know enough about the background, but there must be something there, whatever political turmoil or socioeconomic turmoil they had in the 80s and 90s, um, you know, made these people so harsh. You know, the music yeah, that came out of it, uh, out of that scene was so harsh, much like the Medellin scene, the ultra metal scene of Absolutely. Colombia. You know, they were, <laughs> they were literally fighting for their lives, trying to survive, yes. you know, living on rehearsing the edge, yeah. on top of buildings with the, the shittiest equipment in the world. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so desperate and so um, eager to play, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a place to you put can, your anger. You can feel yeah. it, yeah. So to me, like Brazil, Brazilian black metal in general, 80s and 90s, at least early 90s, represents the most desperate and eager sounding metal ever recorded. Yeah, because I agree. They're, they're always playing a little bit beyond their means and abilities, and um, you know, like, like on Henry, that that record is is like, you know, I, that shouldn't exist to this day. I don't <laughs> think anything is it has topped it. I can't even imagine a bunch of teenagers in twenty twenty three trying to create something like that. You know, unthinkable. Um, yeah. Yeah, just from the looks of it, um, and and the crazy riffs and the Wagner Antichrist vomits, everything about it is so extreme. It's hard for me to believe that anyone now could create it. So it must be a time and place, socioeconomics, you know, politics, whatever it might be. Maybe it's even the weather. Um, yeah, maybe like so. sometimes I call it warm climate metal because maybe the hot hot weather makes them angry or something yeah something like that i remember yeah. an interview with uh actually with masacre uh the, the band from medellin uh and actually the the um, i think it was in uh, fallen pages that was released by a uh, black crucifixion um uh, leader and i remember he he was asking uh, masacre why why are you called masacre we already we already have so many bands called massacre or massacre or something like that and uh, right uh, I remember, the, uh, I can't remember if it was uh, the, the guitarist or, or Bull Metal answering, but he said something like, yes, but we have Massacre here. We are actually, we go in the streets and we see it. Uh, this is uh, something connected to reality to me, which is probably very different for all the other bands named like that. Right. So I think it's sort of a, have something to do with uh, uh, daily violence or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can really hear it in Colombian you know, scene of 1986 to 1988. You can really hear the violence in their music. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's nothing like so, it. 
uh, the Zoom thing is mentioning that it's going to finish in 10 minutes. So if, if we go over, we'll just start another meeting and uh, end yeah, absolutely. Up parts of it out. Yeah. Absolutely. Because there's more to talk about here. There is. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I want to talk more about why the uh, the good stuff that came out in the 90s was so short-lived. You know, the good stuff came out in in waves 1986 there was a huge movement in uh mg with cogamello pushing all these killer bands uh sao paulo as well but yeah. mostly in mg um mostly yeah yeah 86 87 maybe some in 88 but it really trails off you know yeah, there's, absolutely. Just, there's a huge bell curve and then it's uh and then it trails off into the late 90s but then there's a resurgence when black metal gets introduced from canada and europe in the form of blasphemy and uh beherit demos maybe samael yeah exactly. and bands like impurity and mystifier starts up and they take they take up the torch from the old cogumelo bands they refine it, they make it more crazy and extreme. And uh, and then, <laughs> again, the torch goes out somewhere around 93, 94. And then by 95, there's hardly anything to speak of that's worth talking about because then everything starts sounding like generic American death metal yep. or generic European black metal or something. Yes, that's true. So... There must be something to again geopolitics and globalization, um, yep. you know, information coming in from Europe and in the U.S. That's making I believe it much so. Easier. So, what do you think about that? You know, what what are your thoughts on why it fizzled out so quickly in the early nineties? But if you if you look at it, actually. Uh... As indeed in the eighties it didn't really die out because the the torch was passed immediately. But if you if you look at uh, if you look at it with the band that you mentioned, actually blasphemy, Beherit, and if you think about Samael, Rotting Christ, I mean those two bands went on, but the the scene connected to them uh, actually disappeared. So the 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 Brazilian scene disappeared, but the other ones too. Actually, uh, when you think of what was happening in I don't know Belgium, Holland had all these crazy bands. Also, those noise connected mm -hmm. to bestial summoning and stuff. There was also a scene over there. There was one in Malaysia, in, as you know, in Singapore, and there was actually it seems like all the the national scenes uh, were starting to fade away at that point. Um, and I guess, as you say, it's easy to 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 say that. Uh, it's because of the mediatic uh, attention that Norway got. But as you said, there's something in globalization, in the, in the culture becoming more and more only one culture, one worldwide mm -hmm. culture and not many national closed culture that probably made all these powerful scenes disappear. And maybe um, mm. uh, at some point, indeed, too many influences, uh, new culture, new way of lives. Indeed, uh, if you check also what happened in the in the UK, you had so many uh, so many hardcore bands in the eighties. Right. I mean, it was the, the the birthplace of hardcore and and extreme <laughs> punk. But in the nineties, only people dancing to uh, to techno and rave. There was just basically what 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 was there. Something died out right. there as well. Um, well, death metal was going pretty strong at least in the UK. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah pretty 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 good indeed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but the drop off of cultural output from the UK, I don't want to derail this conversation, but that's a, that's something that's that needs a separate podcast, maybe because <laughs> you look at it going all the way back to the 50s, starting with Beatles, and then you got all these classic bands. I mean, not even talking about metal, but every classic band almost came out of there. But even just to concentrate on metal, you had Iron Maiden, Motorhead, Venom, uh, you know, the entire New Age Wish had metal scene. And well, of course, then the punk scene and the grindcore scene and the death metal scene, and then there's a huge drop off somewhere in the nineties. Yes. You know, you could say maybe there's some crap coming out in the pop music scene, but to me, you know, independent underground music or just quality music in general had a sudden drop um, in the nineties. 
And yes, that is. must have something to do with socioeconomic, geopolitical situation in the UK as culture started to change. And that's very unfortunate because that was one of the best places for music and creative output. Yeah, um, definitely. Most important, maybe, indeed, yeah, generally speaking, yeah, for music. Probably, for modern yeah, music, because, yeah. I mean, we always have this conversation among friends here, which had the most impact on metal, US or UK, and probably yeah. UK, because of, like, you know, <laughs> Motorhead and Iron Maiden, those two bands, yeah. and Venom, too, I mean, yeah, and Venom, how yeah. can you compete with that? We got Slayer, you know, but we don't have Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> yes indeed or judas priest oh yeah indeed yeah yeah exactly judas priest and then like, you can keep on naming bands until yeah <laughs> but yeah similar things happen though yeah you're right it it, it it happens there are small group of people who have you know great influence on the scene i mean with norway it's obviously the circle around Euronymous and those guys um but yeah, I mean, similar things happen in Greece. You know, the Greek scene had a very tight knit community uh, between Verathron, Riding Christ, Necromancia. Yeah. And they create a specific sound. But I feel like these days, those, those bands are around, but they don't have the same type of feeling or sound. And sometimes I feel like they're listening to their old records, figuring out what the magic was, but they can't quite put their finger on it. Same goes for Brazil, you know. That yeah. sound is hundred percent almost gone. Um, yeah, absolutely. Maybe absolutely. the only band that's still holding it together is Tormentador between Rodrigo and Armando. Yeah, you know Armando, Nuclear Soldier, and Rodrigo. They've been in the scene since 80, 85 or something. So yeah, they understand that sound. But you know, as we discussed, that even they had a moment in the nineties and early two thousands yeah. where they they lost whatever torch they were holding you know with walk yeah. mines and the, whatever the album came after that that didn't sound anything like holocausto no absolutely not yeah and you can say that about almost every good band that came out of that cogamelo scene you know sarcophago i mean i kind of like all of it but they definitely went for more of a morbid angel sound on scourge you know with a lot of scourge and i don't even yeah. and the other ones aren't even all that interesting yeah, to be honest it's a different Different band, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a different band. And then Sepultura, I mean, obviously, we don't have to say anything about that. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Your embarrassment. It's a different story, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I don't know where we're going with this, but I think... Uh, it's like I, civilization or our civilization sort of peaked in the early 90s, because I think it's probably the same for a lot of other cultural movements there's something going on definitely i mean beside all the things that really influenced metal itself there's something going on with 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 culture at that point yeah um i'm an optimist but <laughs> i think i have Good. to agree with you there because something happened between the 80s and 90s and and then civilization or uh, cultural output started to go down definitely in the 90s um there's more stuff coming out today and more um, more music, more culture, whatever you want to call it, is readily available on the internet. You know, we wouldn't have this conversation over Zoom Absolutely. if it wasn't for the technology. So obviously the technology is enabling, you know, the dispersion of music and art, but I feel like the quality control maybe is way down compared to the, before we got cut off by Zoom, we were just talking about how the cultural peak, I guess, was sometime in the 90s, and then it started to decline. And I was saying that I was an optimist. It might not seem that way just based on the record label name and everything, but um, <laughs> I like to think that there's still visionaries out there creating something special. And it's just harder to find because there's more noise, um, you know, noise to signal ratio is way off now because yeah. uh, the internet makes it much easier to disperse information. And just look at the number of videos and Bandcamp pages that are available and the number of releases that come out, you know, and maybe I'm guilty for flooding the market myself, but I like to think <laughs> that I'm a better curator than most. Um, yeah, most, yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, 
I do think, oh crap. This is trying to do something. Let me just, so Zoom is trying to save something. So, okay. Yeah. So, what, what, what is your, what is your thought on that? You know, the cultural peak of the '90s. What do you think was the culprit there? Uh, what? Well, yeah, I guess culture slowly becoming one, and I guess more TV, more, more technology, and a lot of focus. I guess the the extreme metal actually became much more industrialized also at this point. Lots of people mm -hmm. going into for the business. You can read a lot about that in the in the East End magazine book. They have this whole thing about the scene and the scene points and the, the label going in and out. And when you actually, when you think of the numbers that were start starting to, to sell back then for extreme metal, I mean, not for regular death metal band, but something that was more extreme. The market yeah. was really blowing up in the late 90s. I mean, we have less quality bands, but in the end, you have so many bands and you have uh, actually it's still on very much on the CD culture. So you have many, many records selling. I mean, this is really a highest point in the mm -hmm. 90s. You would, would you would read those those information on some rare CD and you can say you can read uh, something like press that 3000, 10,000 copies of this CD for this 90, late 90s band, which is just unthinkable today. Something like that you would just go out, go out of business if you started trying to to uh, match those numbers. So music became more and more popular, more and more industrialized, but indeed somehow in individuality uh, sort of became, as you say, more hidden behind the noise, something like that. Yeah. So I like to believe that the, the spark is somewhere, you know, amongst the boys. And because of the way that the culture and the scene is, the loudest mouth gets the attention while, you know, somebody quality creating quality music quietly doesn't get as much attention. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. Like, I think like, that's why. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no. I, I okay. mean, I guess that's why also um, labels these days, I think, are very important, not because I want to promote myself, but I think there's so much thing out there and that you need also help to sort it through it's become such a such a struggle to connect to other individuals to that really have something if you just think of the number of stuff you get every day to to be mm -hmm. released on the pro promotional crap that you get i mean uh, in inter-exchangeable e emails that are all the same with the same band camp link in something like sign us please or something like right. that i think that's why you really need to to dig, really need to dig deep. And I, I guess the, the the fortune behind it is that black metal and extreme metal is also a question of individuality. So I think if among all this shit, there will always be some people who want to make a difference, to like just go on the 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 path le the path less traveled. And I think yeah. that's why it connects it connects immediately with good black metal usually. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it, it's hard to find that one gem in the muck um but they're out there you know like Vijay sinister i think we both work with her oh yeah she's true, doing true. something very unique and unique, she understands absolutely. you know i think i like to work with bands that really understand the past because yeah, without understanding the past you can't really create something you know um i i there is a fine line, though, you know, because some bands will internalize too much of external influences and there's nothing coming from within. But I feel like um, somebody who has no knowledge of the past can't come up with anything all that interesting. Yes, I agree. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thin line between... Uh, assimilating too much influences with uh, right. the, the the information information is so easy to get you can just take your phone and spotify and you can find all the battery album all the it's so right. easy these days I, I guess it's thin line to just get lost in the whole thing and to or to just pick exactly what you need to assimilate and make something unique out of it yeah yeah like for example, you know, Mystifier, if you're listening to a Mystifier album, you can clearly hear the sarcophago in there and you can cl clearly hear Blasphemy in there, but it's not exactly like those two. There's something uniquely Mystifier about them. Yeah, and absolutely. Same goes for Impurity. The whispering vocals of the Herod are there, but yeah. 
and you know the blasting parts from blast me are there but it's not exactly like those two bands you know it's something absolutely. totally different on lamb's theory especially yeah, absolutely. It's one plus one equal equal three or something like that. If I yeah, say it like, yeah. Like so that. that's that's what I mean by knowing the past is, you know, they're creating something new from the old. I guess. Absolutely. I don't think there is a way to create something new from the new. Maybe there is. But <laughs> I agree. I think that, that alchemy has not been unlocked yet. You know, I think no, the absolutely. alchemy of digesting old influences, really understanding what's been done in the past, and then trying to come up with something you know refreshing um is the art that i'm seeking absolutely yeah. and, and it's i feel like this challenge yeah yeah i feel like we're on the same band you know bandwidth on what we're looking for out there uh in terms of new music at least yeah i think so yeah so uh let's see we cover a lot of grounds here um i guess it's a good time to talk shit um Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the difference between this book and the numerous so-called black metal journalist books that come out these days is this is obviously written by somebody in the United Forces book as well. As you, it's written by somebody who actually really understands the overall picture, the bigger picture, and isn't just some black metal tourist or metal tourist who happened to just discover black metal two years ago and calls himself a fucking journalist or something, <laughs> you know, and has a very surface level understanding, a surface skimmer understanding of, you know, where black metal started and what the exact uh, trajectory the music took, you know, coming out of Bathory Venom and then morphing into something very extreme in Brazil yeah, the 80s and really peaking around 86, 87 around the Cogmala scene and the importance of that and the stuff that was of course brewing in terms of the Norwegian sound um, and the Swedish Swedish bands as well but uh, the books that come out about Black Mother are always focusing on either Norway, Sweden or US nonsense bullshit of the you know, late 90s or early 2000s. Um, yeah, why do you think that is? Why do you think these these idiot journalists always have to cover Norway, Sweden, US? Obviously, this is not to say anything bad about those countries because I love Norwegian black metal. I love more, uh, Swedish black metal and I, I like a lot of American metal as well. But, you know, it, Brazil usually gets shortchanged, especially the importance of 80s Brazilian scene gets shortchanged by the so-called journalists. So why do you think that is? Is it just stupidity? Maybe that's what it is. It's definitely part of it, but I think there's a lot of, of it that also that's also laziness because what, what they really need to understand is that most of these books that come out these days uh, they have no new information. It's basically something that you can get anywhere that black metal start around with Venom and then proceeded with Battery. And it's basically a comment on that usually. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe they reach out to a few people through the through social media and they interview them. But there's usually nothing new out there because uh, it, it's basically a, an extrapolation of their activity of what they would comment on the social media. I think it's very commentary oriented. And... Um, what is it with, with Brazil is that it hasn't been covered before. So the scene actually, and that's something I really always want to stress out. It's not the uh, black metal. It's not a spectator sport. You have to get in the game. You have to dig out. You have to reach out to people. You have to spend hours of work of trying to find the bands, trying to reach out. They connect with people who might have the demo tapes and listen to it, read the interviews and uh, track down the old magazines connect with people so it's a lot of work and i think behind all these books there's a lot of laziness and it's basically something they could have come up uh, at the at college or something like that it's just a you pick up a few it's it's a synthesis of things that is already written mm -hmm. it's a comment of a comment of a comment or something like that yeah, really yeah. i feel it's... like i think you hit the nail on the head it always feels like some graduate students project about um about black metal there 
they were looking for more information on Wikipedia or something, you know. It just it's written so so lazily that I under I you know, I I just wonder how it gets published. You know, there's so many of them. You know, if you there's go to so many, yes. Mobile or something, you can see all these books there. I don't really understand why publishers are so willing to publish these garbage books about black metal. It's, it's yes, it's crazy. crazy rehashing the same bullshit all over and all over just really really you can just switch the names and it's the same book i mean switch the titles and it's the same book basically it's incredible yeah yeah i guess that's an industry in itself uh publishing about the history of black metal <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> maybe one day somebody will write a comprehensive book that actually talks about the most important scenes um which is a good topic i guess to discuss i mean in my opinion you know, obviously, Bath v. Venom was the most important. Uh, but from there, Brazil took that torch and ran with it and kept it for at least five years in the 80s as the most important scene. Um, and that should be highlighted by any Absolutely. stupid book about black metal. There should be an entire chapter about the importance of Brazilian black metal or whatever you want to call it, deathcore. Absolutely, because they really uh, they took they took that sound created by Sodom, Bath, V, Venom, and put spikes on it, put corpse paint on it, and made yeah. it more extreme. The drums are just so crazy, you know that that whole style of hitting everything at once, that DD crazy drum sound. It's yeah. still it's still the most extreme way to play blast to this day. And that yeah, was all invented by those Cogmello bands. Um, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. Just uh, I just want to make sure that's heard by everyone. Brazil <laughs> had the most important scene in the '90s or '80s. I mean, um, not so much in the '90s. Um, that's something to talk about as well. The the decline of the the scene in Brazil in the '90s. But uh, yeah, I just want to I just want to make sure I nail that into people's heads. All the posers out there. <laughs> Brazil had the most important scene. And then in the 90s, I guess you could say Norway had the most important scene. But in the 80s, Brazil had that torch. So yeah, absolutely. Idiots, and writing books, make sure Brazil <laughs> at least has covered half of the book, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and absolutely. Do your yeah. homework, retard. Yeah, do your homework. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you when you actually when you when you ask other people about what's the best label for extreme metal, what what was the greatest label? Yeah, and for me, it's. I mean, of course, it's. There's a lot of 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 room to debate here. But for me, Kogumelo published the most amazing records back then. It's just incredible when you think of all the crazy. Oh records. yeah, it, it's just insane. Just Sepultura, Sarcophago. They had Holocausto. They had the Warfare Noise thing. They had all mm -hmm. the best bands. They are one of the most important label in extreme metal history. I think it's the the way way beyond so many others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm still digging into the Kogumelo catalog of the 90s you know there's some crazy grindcore and death metal stuff that never yeah. gets this gets gets any mention like um medicine death you ever oh, heard that death. one absolutely. yeah, medicine yeah death. Absolutely. that was it's really good cool. yeah um, absolutely like the first those are like the first headhunter dc what was that kogumelo or somebody else I no it was kogumelo indeed yeah, yeah that was the first it's, yeah yeah that, that first it's amazing was great. yeah that one was great it's amazing yeah you know it's a combination of I don't know, European American death metal with the old Cogamello sound with the sarcophago Holocausto sound. Um yeah, absolutely. And uh blasphemy hoodie on the on the band. Right, yeah, exactly. Back, yeah. Blasphemy hoodie, which is something in nineteen ninety one, I think. That that that's a statement, I think. It is, yeah. I mean, you really have to be in touch with the band to get it, you know. So these yeah, people absolutely. were all connected to the best music at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, on the second album, they went morbid angel. <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. It's less good. It's less good. Yeah, so it's harder to get, but it's less good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same with the. Uh, I feel like expulsor fornications. You know that was not Cagumelo, but I forgot who released it. Alien or maybe it was Heavy Metal Maniacs. One of those labels. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, fornications was a, one of the most perfect recordings in my opinion it's perfect yeah yeah one of the most perfect it's like right up there with Henry and you know it's sexual. it's really excellent yeah yeah i mean up there was sex trash and Henry and 
volcano and stuff like that. Um, but then on the unholy one, I feel like they got perverted by American death metal or European death metal. It's yeah, still definitely. good. It's a, it's still a good album. Uh, but some some outside influence came in and sort of ruined it. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. It's not that good anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there. I guess, like you said, there's a fine line between, you know, digesting too much external influences. Yeah. And digesting just enough. Uh, yeah, indeed. Without losing that identity that makes it so important that the individual identity that makes uh you know music very interesting yeah scene I... scene specific uh music very interesting yeah uh, yeah so yeah let's talk about that now uh, what happened <laughs> in the the 90s brazil you know what what exactly happened around 95 that led to that decline and the sound that was cultivated. Um, in my opinion, it was like something, something like out of controlness of blasphemy, but there it combined with the past Brazilian sound of Cogamelo and something from Greece, maybe Rotting Christ, Verathron definitely were influenced, the Semiel as well. And that was a perfect formula in the early 90s, you know, that. Yes, it was. The Wicca. Uh, Lamb's Theory, Murder Rave's first album. Um, actually, first two albums are good. By Murder first Rave. two albums are good, yeah. yes. The second yeah. one particularly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Amen Corner, all these bands had very distinct 90s Brazilian sound. But then around 94, 95, something happened, just started to go down. And whatever bands were remaining, still producing music from that time period, started to sound more either European black metal, uh, like murder rape, or uh, more death metal, and started to just kind of taper off from there into the 2000s. And they never did, they never recovered from that, you know, that no, they never did. No, no, yeah. absolutely. And something so, obviously went wrong, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure if, if because between what's interesting is that between the 80s and the 90s, there was a perfect continuity. I mean, people were ready to, and, and they were craving it because the the original bands like Holocausto and Sepultura, they were making a different sound, less aggressive. And uh, the bands, I mean, they stated that they were disappointed with the new sound of the Warfare Noise bands and they wanted to to reinvent it in a way. But that didn't happen in the uh, in the mid '90s. Somehow the next generation wasn't ready to to carry on, and all the bands sort of died out. Uh, even the ones that kept on making music, like Mystifier, and uh, I think Amen Corner actually did a few more albums. They're, they're mm -hmm. still around doing records, but something was never the same. Something was never the same, and the aggressivity the ag the aggressivity uh, uh, is the is the the key thing that really disappeared. Right. Of course, you can yeah, still find that... bands. They're not doing drums very crazy anymore, you know. No, like, indeed, crazy. indeed. Some, so, something really, uh, really uh, watered down. The insanity really watered down because they were really crazy. And some of the bands we put on the CD, um, it's almost it, it's not something you would play to your friends. It's something really uh, brutal and insane, and it's it has its own quality of insanity. It's just it's just mm -hmm. cra crazy satanic noise. It's really what it is. It's just let's. Right. Make a racket. Let's get angry and 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 play that that noisy satanic thing. And it's gonna be amazing. And somehow this is what really disappeared. I think the 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 insanity, the 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 crave for noise and for rough rough satanism, not not going too deep on it, but just being it's it was part of the of the rough of the um, of the violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess we talked about it before, but it's basically a combination of globalization, uh, trends in underground metal changing Absolutely. to something a little bit more diluted and mainstream, I guess. I mean, this, this is around the time that Earache was working with Sony, and you could yep. find the latest Carcass album at the biggest chain record store. You know, Morbid Angel was playing big, big festivals, and yeah. Um, Things were getting kind of big. Uh, I remember on MTV, yeah, yeah, exactly. Morbid Angel having a video on MTV. I thought I thought that was the weirdest thing at the time, but yeah. in hindsight, I guess that was that was basically the peak of 
underground metal and it started to decline from there <laughs> because look yeah, at what Open Angel turned into afterwards. <laughs> yeah. So I think we've talked about a lot here. Anything else that you want to talk about? Um, any more shit talking? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they're better left forgotten and the name's not dropped because it's not worth the attention actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's I, I would really encourage anyone actually from from the scenes and anyone that is interested to really get in touch with the bands they're 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 into. Definitely uh I would encourage you, even if it's not um a way to uh to get freshest information, but I think the fans in culture is still very important because this is still this is still how I discover music. I, even if I want to know what's going on in the 2000s, for instance, I still read a lot of fans in from that era because there's someone making reviews and talking shit or talking good on some bands. I would really encourage that to just get in the game, have a, have a magazine, try to connect with the bands. If you're interested to have a story, the more we are to 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 really dig, the 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 wider it's gonna get, and the more influence also for quality work is gonna is, is gonna have. So, I would really encourage to anyone who used to be in that scene to try to reach out and maybe make a make their memoirs like uh, Marcello did, like Metal Lion did. I think it, those testimonies are important, but on the other on the other side, there's, I mean, you have communications like you never had before, so it's it's really good to try and reach out. Right, but just to add to that, um, anybody who goes down that road though, please don't do it digitally because those files will go away. You have to make an analog product like this you know, if it's just a zine, then just Xerox it. Do whatever you can do. Um, Xeroxing isn't very expensive. There's also Absolutely. like Amazon publishing where you can get stuff almost printed for free um, on demand. So, you know, if you have something to publish, please publish it as a physical object. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's important in this day and age to try to move away from digitization and um, just computer bullshit, you know. I, I feel Absolutely. like the the advent of uh, AI is going to ruin a lot of things, and I don't want um, the zine culture, the preservation culture, the archival culture to yeah. just die away just because everything is on the internet. Uh, those files can be wiped out, you know. What if uh, the censorship committee of Google or something just decides? The satanic stuff is just not uh, allowed, you know. Yeah, absolutely, uh, that could easily happen. There's been the creeping sense of censorship everywhere these days. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to encourage all the young diehards out there to print zines. I know, uh, even if you're printing thirty copies, I think it's it's worthwhile. It's something, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. People and will I, remember I think it. The other thing. Uh, the other thing about a physical media is that you have to express yourself somehow, not just like, you know, words on a piece of paper. There's going to be art, there's going to be aesthetic, there's going to be layout. Whereas on the internet, there's not much to that, you know, it's just there's no individuality. Yeah. yeah, there's no individuality. There's just text on screen, and then you might have some generic border that gets repeated on every single page of the website. It's just not the same. No, it's tasteless, um, yeah. I like the way that Bardo methodology is doing it. Part of it is published online, and he doesn't always publish the whole thing online, so you have to get the physical media to read the entire article. Okay. And I think that's the better way to do it if you're going to do both. You know, if you're going to have yeah, some presence online, then don't publish the whole thing there. Um, do a physical media. So Yeah, absolutely. People will forget the digital stuff as soon as they have new digital stuff, which is all the time. But right. uh, a zine in your hand, in your hands, a piece of paper on your desk that you just grab while listening to music, it's something you put your mom, your it's something you put your memory into, and it's uh, it's gonna be priceless, definitely. Yeah, I mean, all the emails that I'm writing to friends, those are not archived. You know, no, whereas <laughs> physical letters that you send to somebody, that person may keep it. Um, before 
the fucked up death of Joe from Goldborg, he sent me his entire archive of letters. So I still have them and I haven't read all of them, but it's it's fucking That's hilarious crazy. to read through them. There are letters from him to Sakis from Rotting Christ. And you know, this is when you know um Rotting Christ was a grindcore band. I and, am. and they're just talking about in very crude English, just talking about, you know, extreme metal. And that's archived. That's like a snapshot of a time and place that's uh, not reproducible. Yeah, absolutely. And if we had the computer technology back then, this wouldn't exist. You know, there's no way to. That's true. It's not the same, the archive and email. It's, it's, it's faceless and it's just digital zeros and ones. And most of the time, those files are just not kept. You know, these communications are not kept. So, you know, it might seem a little bit ironic that we're having this conversation digitally <laughs> and I'm going to publish this on YouTube or something, but uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can put it on DVD. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> can make a transcript and print it, definitely, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Taufik, I really appreciate your time and uh, all the effort you put into this enormous 260-page book, <laughs> which comes with two compilation CDs uh, covering much of the bands that um, you interviewed in the book itself. So, yeah, thank you very much for your hard work, uh, dedication to the book and the scene. So I thank you for supporting. Oh, yeah. yes, will do. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's it for today. Thank you.